Shall we turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 17? Paul's reception in Europe leaves something to be desired. In Philippi, he was beaten, thrown in prison, and then asked to leave the city. In Thessalonica, he left the city under the cover of darkness. In Berea, again after the uprising, Paul took off, headed to Athens. And now in Athens, he is stirred within his heart when he sees a city that is given over wholly to idolatry. He is really there to just sort of wait for Timothy and Silas. But he is so touched spiritually by the darkness that he starts sharing with people. And soon he is invited to come to share his thoughts and ideas with the Greek philosophers there on Mars Hill. And so in verse 22, we find Paul standing there. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, above Paul is the Acropolis, below him is the Agora, with the great temple of Zeus, many altars throughout that marketplace down below. Altars that are made to every God imaginable. Before Paul stands the intelligentsia of the day, represented by the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, who had nothing better to do than to tell or to listen something new. And so Paul, in his opening remarks, declares to them, I perceive that you are very religious. Now, King James is sort of an unfortunate translation. Uh, King James said, Paul said, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Paul is too smart to start off insulting his audience. And so he observes you're very religious. I, I've observed that you're a very religious people because I was observing your devotions. We're told earlier that Paul was stirred when he saw the city that was wholly given over to idolatry. He saw them as they were worshiping these false gods and it moved his heart. People can be very devoted and very zealous in the worship of their false gods. In fact, many times people in their zeal and worship of their false gods put us to shame in our devotion to the true and the living God. Many times they are more committed they are more devoted to their false gods. I think of Islam and the tremendous devotion these people have to Allah and how they're willing to give their lives for Allah. And I wonder just uh, how many Christians would be willing to give their lives for the cause. We, we seem to have developed sort of a convenient relationship with the Lord. If it's convenient, I will serve you. If it's convenient, I will be there to worship. But it's more a convenience rather than something that is of true and great devotion. Now, I know I'm preaching to the empty pews right now. Uh, you're here. And so uh, 
I'm preaching to those that are on the radio uh, who... Uh, <laughs> It wasn't convenient, you know, to come. It's easier to just sit and turn on the radio. So uh, I think too many times preachers preach to those that aren't there rather than to those that are there. You're here, and you're to be commended for that. It shows a degree of devotion uh, above the others. <laughs> So Paul said, I saw an altar that was inscribed to the unknown God. Now, the Greeks had deified just about everything they could think of. But if by chance we missed a God, we don't want him to be angry or want, don't want her to be angry with us. And so we'll build an altar and uh, it will be to the unknown God. Now, in reality, they had a lot of altars to unknown gods. Uh, there was a great plague in Athens. And so uh, in order to sort of... Uh, ameliorate the plague. They turned a lot of uh, sheep and goats loose in the city of Athens. And wherever a sheep would stop or a goat would stop and stand, they would then sacrifice that goat or sheep to the nearest idol, to the nearest worship center. And if it would stop, say, uh, not close to any idol or worship center, then they would build a altar to the unknown God and offer the sheep or the goat to that altar of the unknown God. So Paul referred to this altar that he saw, the inscription to the unknown God. And... It is interesting to me that in worshiping and creating so many gods, they did really miss the only true and the living God. In other words, they worshiped the sun, the moon, they worshiped the planets, uh, they, they worshiped the constellations. Uh, they they worship just about any, they worship love they worship hate they worship uh, the various emotions that a person feels. But somehow they missed the true, the living God, and so Paul is saying, the unknown God to you. That's the God I want to talk to you about. The God that you worship in ignorance, I want to tell you about him. He is the God that made the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them. Now, we notice immediately how different Paul's message is when he is talking to these Greeks who are totally ignorant of the true and the living God. You see, when Paul would go into the synagogue and he would begin to talk to them in the synagogue about God, they knew exactly who he was talking about. The God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who revealed himself in the Old Testament. And, and so his message to them, he could start from what they already knew and build from there. Here, these people are totally ignorant of the true and the living God. They're ignorant of the God who created the universe and everything that is in it. And so he has to start 
really just building a foundation from uh, just scratch, you might say. Because they have no concept, no foundation for the truth of the living God. So, this is the God he said, I want to talk to you about. The one that created our universe and everything that is in it. First of all, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Above Paul was the beautiful Parthenon. The temple that was built to the goddess Athena, who was the patron goddess of Athens. That beautiful Parthenon with its 40 marvelous white marble towers some 283 feet long and 170 feet wide and 60 feet high, monumental art of uh, architecture. And it today you stand and look at that and you just stand in awe. You wonder how in the world did they ever build this mammoth temple there on the top of the Acropolis. And so Paul is saying the true God, he doesn't dwell in temples. Down below Paul, there in the Agora, there at the one end, the temple to Zeus, great temple down there. And Paul said he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Actually, when Solomon had built the temple for God in the uh, fulfilling of his father David's dream. As they were dedicating the temple to God. Solomon acknowledged that the heavens of heaven could not contain God. How much less this temple that we have built. I think that it is really wrong to call a church the house of God, because I think that that gives us a wrong impression. As though God lives here in opposition to living everywhere. So let's go to the house of God to worship God. Lord, it's wonderful to come into your presence in your house tonight. It gives us the wrong concept. We don't come into the presence of God. We dwell constantly in the presence of God. Yes, God dwells here, but not here any more than he dwells any place else. He fills the universe. The heavens of heaven cannot contain him. And I think that it is wrong for us to Think of God in locality and, and to think that God is localized in some place or in some building rather than having that understanding, that realization. As David said, where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I descend into hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and I flee to the uttermost parts of the sea, even there you surround me. David had the proper concept of God. And uh, people, when they build a temple to a God, they believe that the God dwells in that temple. And, and so they go to that temple to, to worship their God. But he doesn't dwell in temples made with man's hands. Neither is he worshipped, Paul says, with man's hands. Within the temples, there were hundreds of people that were employed by the temple to do the service of the temple. Uh, to do the sacrifices and uh, the, the various duties. And 
uh, they were looked upon as the priest of the temple. And they are there serving God, their gods. But Paul says he isn't served by our hands, with man's hands. There was the idea among the pagans that gods, their gods, need to be fed. And, of course, uh, they would uh, take the sacrifices, and the sacrifices of the pagans were different from the sacrifices in Judaism. The pagans, in their sacrifices, it was sort of offering the food to God. We're feeding God. Whereas in Judaism, the sacrifices weren't to feed God. The sacrifices were to acknowledge that the result and the effect of sin is death. And thus, it was a substitutionary sacrifice. It shows that the animal died. The penalty of death was meted upon the animal in order to propitiate God for the sins of the individual. So a a whole different concept as far as the offering of sacrifices uh, in Judaism to the offering of the sacrifices in the pagan temples. Paul said as though God needs anything. God is completely self-sufficient. It's ludicrous to think that God needs me or God needs something from me. I need God. He could do very well without me. He did very well without me a long time before I was ever born. God doesn't need me. It is an honor, it is a privilege to serve God. It's a blessing. But it's not that God needs me. He doesn't need anything. He's total. He's complete in himself. And yet, he gives us the privilege of working together with him in his great work in the world today. In Psalm 50, David sort of expresses this whole idea Actually, God is speaking. David is writing as a prophet now. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against thee, for I am God, thy God. I will not reprove you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings that have been continually before me, I will take no bullock out of your house, nor he goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and you will glorify me. So God is saying, you don't need to feed me. Uh, That's in the pagan religions, the idea of feeding their gods. But uh, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. how different that is from the impression that we get watching telethons. I do not sustain God. God sustains me. Paul said he gives to all life and breath and all things. That is, I owe my very existence to God. And he not only created me, but he sustains me. 
Then Paul declared to them that he has made of one blood all nations. Now this is interesting because people used to think that because a person was of a different ethnic group, because they had more uh, pigmentation in their skin, or because uh, they, they had different facial features, that somehow people were different. Paul's saying not so. And of course, what Paul has said has been affirmed by science today as we've come to understand that we are all of the same family. Uh, these differences of facial features and skin pigmentation is only the result of uh, adaptation to various environments and, and a gene pool getting uh, sort of uh, mutated and, uh, and so the traits come out within the ethnic groups but basically we are all one and this business of a superior white Aaron race is nonsense um the Aaron superiority comes from the nonsensical evolutionary theory. We're all one blood. There is no super race or privileged race. The Jews were called the chosen people, but chosen for what? They were chosen by God as to be the nation through which he would bring the Messiah into the world. That was their choice. God chose them for that special honor that they were to bring the Messiah into the world. And thus, they had the oracles of God. But now that the Messiah has come, the Bible tells us that in Christ Jesus... There is neither Jew nor Greek, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. And it is important that we as Christians recognize this truth that Paul is declaring to these philosophers. God is made of one blood, all men. We all go back to Adam. We all come from Adam and the one man. Paul goes on to say he has determined the times before appointed and the boundaries of their habitations. Here Paul is opposing both the Stoics who believed in fate and the Epicureans who believed only in chance. Paul is saying, not so. God has appointed our habitations and our boundaries. We are what God has made us. We're not here by chance or accident. That, Paul declares, the purpose is that they should seek the Lord. Someone has said that God has put eternity in our hearts. Another has said or suggested that there is built into every man a heart-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. God created us that we should seek the Lord. Paul affirms this in his letter to the Romans. He said, For the creature, that is us, was made subject unto emptiness, not willingly, but by the reason or design of him who has subjected the same in hope. God created me, and when 
Adam was created, he was created a whole person, body, soul, and spirit. When Adam sinned, his spirit died. He was no longer a whole person. He was two-thirds of a person. He was body, he was soul, but the spirit was dead. So a vast part of man was missing and is missing until he is born of the spirit, has a spiritual birth, or as Jesus termed it, born again by the spirit. And then you become a whole person once more. But until that being born again, regeneration by the Spirit, there is that emptiness, there is that consciousness of something missing in life. A consciousness of that void. And, of course, the problem is the many things that people seek to endeavor to fill that void. The things they do hoping to fill that void. And, of course, it seems like they get more bizarre all the time. Why is it that at the uh, entertainment parks, flag, five flags and knots and all of these... I don't know. It's out there near Saga somewhere. How is it that they have to keep adding new attractions? Uh, the rides have to be faster, higher, uh, more exciting, more twists and turns. And uh, now to the point where uh, some of them are even considered uh, dangerous because of the the brain hitting uh, the the skull in these quick turns and all and uh, but why do they have to keep adding more attractions and more uh, exciting exhilarating kind of rides because it gets old hat after a while you see a person goes out there for an evening and the first time you get on that ride and you do the loops and everything else, it's, it's screaming, it's yelling, it's a rush, it's a thrill and oh, can't wait to go back. But after a while, it doesn't give you the same rush. Uh, you were trying to fill something inside but for a moment you thought this is it and then you discover after a while it isn't it. And so it's, you need something new. You need something different. As we try in vain to fill the void that God created in us. By design. That we would seek after God. That's the whole purpose of this built-in void. The thirst that we have in our spirit as David said, as the deer panteth for the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirst for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And, and what David expressed is true of every man. There is that clamant cry within man for a meaningful relationship with God. Uh, Henry Drummond in his book, uh, The Natural and the Supernatural, said, there is within the very protoplasm of man little tentacles that are reaching out for God. Man is not complete without God. And so as Paul is talking to these philosophers, he's talking about that God has made us all. He has set the limitations for all of us, our boundaries, our habitation and all that we might seek God. He, he built it that way, that we might seek after God and perhaps reach out for Him, though Paul said He's not far from us. Paul 
wrote to the Romans. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ from the dead. But what does the scripture say? The word is near to you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made to salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. God is not far off that somewhere out there in the universe that we have to bring him down. Nor is he buried in the depths that we have to bring him up. But Paul said he's very near to us. For he said, in him we live, we move, we have our being. I think of how Belshazzar had taken over the kingdom from his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. And though the city of Babylon was under siege, the walls were so great that they felt very secure and safe within the city. And so... Belshazzar ordered this great party, feast, for a thousand of his lords. And they are going in a, and it wasn't just a come for an evening, it was going on for days. And again, you know, things sort of get old, you need something to spice it up, so... He ordered that they bring the gold and the silver vessels that his grandfather had removed from the temple in Jerusalem and to fill them with wine that they might drink their wine out of these special vessels that had been consecrated in Jerusalem to the temple worship of God. And as they were drinking their wine out of these gold and silver vessels, and praising the gods of gold and silver, suddenly they were sobered up by a hand that was writing on the wall words that they did not understand. And immediately he began to shake. His knees began to knock against each other. He ordered his wise men, counselors, to tell him what it was saying. They were unable to do so. And so the queen mother mentioned that in the time of his grandfather, there was a young man from Israel, now an older man, a prophet, who was able to interpret dreams and difficult sayings. And so Daniel was brought in. And he was promised uh, a great position by Belshazzar, a gold chain about his neck and all, if he would interpret for the king the writing on the wall. Daniel assured him that he could interpret the writing on the wall, but he first of all preached him a sermon. And he reminded him of his grandfather and the great kingdom that his grandfather had developed. But reminded him that when his grandfather was lifted up with pride, that the God of heaven allowed him to go insane for seven uh, seasons until he recognized that it was God who ruled. And he said, you have taken the vessels that your grandfather brought from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and you have drunk your wine out of them, praising the gods in gold and silver, but the very God in whose hand your breath is, you've not glorified. He didn't know God 
He had no understanding of God and yet he depended upon God for his very breath and that is true of people today. Many people do not know God and yet they depend upon God for their very breath. But what a sad kind of a a tragedy that with that very breath they curse God. The breath that God has given to them They use it to curse God. God's not under any obligation to keep any of us alive. And I think of the audacity of man. Here the breath was fouled with wine, the smell of wine. The God in whose very hand your breath is. Paul is saying to these philosophers, God's not far away. He's very close to us. In fact, in him we live, we move, we have our being. How we need to be aware of this very truth tonight. I'm surrounded by God. I can't escape his presence. He is with me, surrounds me, wherever I am. In him I live, I move. That's not just Christians. That was these philosophers there in Athens who worshiped God ignorantly. They didn't know him. And yet in him they lived, they moved, they had their being. They were surrounded by him. David in Psalm 139 said, You have beset me behind and before, and you laid your hand upon me. That is, Lord, you're behind me, you're in front of me, and you've laid your hand on me. I mean, I'm surrounded in him. We live, we move, we have our being. Then Paul quotes one of their own poets. He said, Some of your own poets have said, We are his offspring." We were made in the image of God. He breathed into Adam and Adam became a living soul. We were related to God in the beginning. Adam was. But that relationship was broken when Adam sinned. Now God's desire is to restore that relationship. To give to us that which was lost by Adam's disobedience. And so God sent his only begotten son for the purpose of reconciling man back to God, bringing man back into the image of God, that image from which sin had separated us from the image of God. Paul said, We with open face, as we behold the glory of the Lord, are being changed from glory to glory into the same image by the power of his spirit that is working in us. You see, God's purpose is to restore you back into the image of God. That's how God created man in the beginning. And the purpose of of redemption through Christ is the restoration of man back into the image of God. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4 that God has set in the church. First of all, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all come into the unity of the faith, into the knowledge of the Son of God, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of the image of Christ. David said, and I shall be satisfied when I awake in his likeness. And one of these days, as the Spirit of God works in us, we will awake in his likeness. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doesn't yet appear what we're going to be, but we know that when he appears, we'll be like him, for we will see him as he is. So your poets have said, we are his offspring. 
then inasmuch as we are the offspring of God, your poets were right, we should not think of God as something that has been made of silver or gold or something that is made by the hands of men. Now, men have always sought to make gods. And when a man makes a god, he makes it like himself but only a projection of himself to infinity. Man makes his little idols, makes it like unto man. He's making his God like himself. But you shouldn't think of God as something that is made by man's hands. There in Athens, all of these statues, all of these images, there in uh, the uh, Parthenon, there was at one time this large golden statue of Athena, the goddess that they would go and worship, and uh, the various idols that were in uh, the, the temples and in the altars where people would go to worship uh, these idols. But you shouldn't think of God as someone that has been made by man's hands. All of these little images, all of these little idols that you are worshiping, you're wrong in, in thinking of, of God as being something made by man. And yet, that is so true. Man made gods. I often have people ask me questions like, why did God, and the moment they ask the question, why did God, I'm stumped. <laughs> because I don't know. God said, my ways are not your ways. My ways are beyond your finding out. But usually the question is born from the idea that if I were God, I would not have done it this way. And, and usually there is a challenge of, of God's justice or a challenge of God's love or, or something of that nature when they say, why did God? And, and again, it's just saying, if I were God, not the way I'd do it. And there are people who have composite gods. They say, well, I believe in all religions and so uh, I take a little bit from uh, Buddhism, and I take a little bit from Mohammedism, and I take a little bit from Christianity, and a little bit, you know, and put it all together, and I've got my composite picture of God. I pick and choose. I like this part of Buddhism. I like this part of Confucianism, and I like this part of Shintoism, and so I, I'm putting together this composite, and, and uh, there's parts of this that I don't like, so that's not a part of my concept of God. And, and, and you, you create your own God. And people then worship man-made gods. But the Bible teaches us that God is not man-made. That, man, that actually man is made by God rather than God being made by man. There are people that say that God is the invention of man. God is the creation of man's mind and man's imagination. Not so. Man is created by God, not God created by man. Now, the Greeks were tremendous artists. And uh, their art is still just a thing almost of perfection. And thus they made their images from marble or silver, gold. 
But Paul is saying you shouldn't think of God as an inanimate object. God is alive. He's not something that man has carved out or molded out of silver or gold. And any likeness of God made with gold, silver, or even painted pictures immediately degrades God into something less than he actually is. Because he's alive. And we can't really make any representation because the representation is not alive. God is alive and we need to think of him as alive. And God ordered that we not try to make any likeness of him. Because he's alive and the moment you make a likeness you've got something that's dead. Inanimate, and, and that's not, it can't truly then represent God. This message of Paul to those Epicurean and Stoic philosophers is truly a masterpiece. To start from their ignorance and start to build the message of the unknown God for them, declaring unto them the nature and all of God. It, it's a masterpiece, and uh, we'll continue with Paul's message next Wednesday night as we uh, continue on here in the uh, 17th chapter. Father, we're so grateful that you are alive and that you are touched by our feelings of infirmity. And that you are there, Lord, to help us, to assist us, to provide for us. And Lord, how thankful we are for your goodness and for your provisions that you have made. Now, Lord, as we have gathered here tonight, we look to you That you might impart to us, Lord, that life-giving spirit by which the dross of our life is being consumed and the pure is left. Oh God, purge us and we shall be clean. Put us through the fire, Lord, the cleansing, purifying. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather and to worship you. And Lord, as we leave this place, help us, Lord, to be fully cognizant of the fact that we're not leaving you here but that you're going with us and that you are with us wherever we go. May we be conscious of the fact that we are surrounded by you, that in you we live, we move, we have our being. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.